right. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Emmanuel Joseph Akile, and I'm the host of The Dawn Show. Uh, it's one of the flagship programs on iRadio. It's my pleasure today to uh, interview Dr. James Ukuk, a political analyst. We're going to talk about a number of issues pertaining to the implementation of the revitalized peace agreement, which was signed in the Ethiopian capital, Addis Ababa, in September 2018. Dr. Ukuk, it's good to have you with us. It's been a while. Thank you, Emmanuel Akili, and it is my pleasure to come and talk with you after a long time of silence. Yes. Uh, Dr. Ukuk, uh, to begin with, uh, let's, uh, uh, let's have your view and uh, your assessment on uh, the current implementation of the Revitalized Peace Agreement. Tomorrow we are going to mark one year since the establishment of the new uh, unity government. So as a political analyst, Doctor, what is your over overall view or assessment on this new peace accord? Thank you once more, Emmanuel. Um, of course, the, the assessment has to be done according to the, bench, the benchmarks, which, uh, uh, which are very clear, and these are the, the eight chapters of the Revitalized Peace Agreement. Mm. And for us to, to start with even Chapter 1, we have to get to the background uh, that uh, led to, to this Revitalized Peace Agreement. We remember uh, what we call the high-level revitalization forum. It is the forum that became the medium where the parties were urged and persuaded by the region and the international community, particularly the IGAT, uh, to take their grievances on the table and, uh, and focus on three major things. One mm. is to end the war. Mm -hmm. because it was getting very nasty and so many people were getting displaced and uh, <coughs> and then humanitarian uh, you know fatigue was also getting higher among the international community mm -hmm. so the face the first objective was to stop the war mm -hmm. uh, the second objective was to build peace and you have to build it after you have made it so they were told that, you know, you are capable to make peace, but also the most important thing is to build it so that it becomes a sustainable peace. And all the parties were right to solemnly pledge that they will do that. Mm. The third objective was to build the country because, you know, the war has destroyed many parts of the country. For example, take the second largest uh, city in South Sudan, that's Malakal. It has totally been ruined and reduced to a ghost town. So it is time also to, to build and rebuild uh, what has been destroyed uh, so that people can go back to their original livelihood and start enjoying rather than suffering. So these were the three objectives and then the parties were told to focus on that with a lot of uh, regional and international pressure. Good enough uh, with involvement of President al-Bashir and also President al-Museveni, they managed to bring the main rival uh, politician together. That is uh, Dr. Riyak Mashar and then President Salfakir. And they persuaded them to follow the three objectives of the high level revitalized revitalization forum mm. and that is how we ended up with the eight chapters of the the revitalized agreement mm. it was the whole agreement we got adjusted uh, in some aspect yeah. so as we come to anniversary of one year uh, after the formation of the the national uh, government of uh, the revitalized national government of national unity uh, we we look at those chapters one by one. So let's start with chapter one. Yeah, uh, sure. And chapter one is actually about governance, mm. and it starts from the presidency. So good enough on twenty second, uh, twenty twenty, uh, the presidency was reconstituted. That's with the and appointment the, of the first yes, vice president. And the first the vice president vice got sworn in mm. exactly. Uh, on 22nd February 2020. Yeah. Uh, it was followed one month later by the appointment of, of uh, the members of 
the Council of Ministers, uh, 35 of them, plus 10 deputies. Mm -hmm. and, but then the whole thing is stopped there because the agreement said uh, uh, the establishment or a constitution of the revitalized government with all its wings, uh, starting from the executive, coming to the judiciary and, and going to the legislature, uh, both the the assembly and the council of uh, mm. of a state, mm. they were supposed to be formed concurrently. It mm. means at the same time, so that they run together. Which has been overdue, actually. Yeah, but mm. then I think we got stuck at the at the level of the presidency and then the uh, the the council of ministers, and then the transitional legislative assembly has remained and reconstituted after now, and when they incorporated the peace agreement into 2011 amended constitution, you know, they almost tried to renew their mandate, which was contrary to the agreement. But this mm. was stopped later by the IGAD and the argument, mm. and then it was addressed that uh, the current parliament cannot just renew its mandate automatically like that. There is a new parliament that has to be appointed Mm. according to the agreed uh, percentages. Yeah, uh, that's 332 the mm. uh, plus uh, 128 plus 10 and 10 and then plus 8. Mm. Th these are the five parties that should uh, should constitute that. Uh, then that was put into rest. Mm. The judiciary was was supposed to have three major benchmark mm. uh, touch in it. Uh, one of it is uh, is the is the Judicial uh, Reform Commission, and uh, <coughs> that was that was not uh, Judicial Reform Committee. I mean, that mm -hmm. was not uh, tight up to now. Mm. Then have ju Judicial Service uh, Services uh, Commission, mm. which is an old commission. It has not been reconstituted so far. And then we have the establishment of Constitutional Court. Nothing has been touched. So judiciary re remain as the whole way it has been. Nothing has been touched in it. And a lot of judges have deserted their profession because it is no longer attractive. So it is almost like a paralyzed uh, wing of the government with only the chief justice appearing to just uh, do Sony. the ceremony mm. of a swearing in, mm. but uh, the, the rest of them. Then we come to uh, to the states, of course, after after putting in, in place the the national government, the state government were also supposed to be formed together with the local government, and that took a long time because there was the issue of the uh, determining the number and and demarcation of those states. Mm. So it took it took the the Independent Boundary Commission to do that, and, mm. and that that almost took one year. But they managed to complete uh, their duty in time, and uh, and then the report was submitted to the parties. But then the parties were dragging their feet, mm. and then they ended in deadlock, mm. including the percentages of uh, who should take uh, uh, which ministry we should take, given the governor of which state, it took them almost mm. a very long time. And on that also we spoke recently to uh, the uh, Secretary of Information of the main party, SPLM, and he was saying uh, it is the governors in those 10 states are the one confusing this, because he was saying the governors are confused, they don't know, they don't understand the percentages. They keep on bringing the names to the presidency and the the government tells them, you go back and please review these uh, names of the nominees before you bring them forward. So there's this back and forth, uh, and mean like this loggerhead happening, but it's not really clear uh, who is really delaying this process of the establishment of the state government. I mean, we've seen yesterday uh, the uh, president appointed uh, the uh, cabinet and some commissions and advisors in Central Equatorial State. Yes, because the, you know, many of those politicians do not read the agreement. Mm -hmm. And each one want to do things according to their whims and moods. Uh, but the referent is the agreement. And, and they, they just assume that they know the agreement. The agreement does not give the governors authority to appoint uh, any minister or commissioner. This is, this is done by the, 
the parties. And the agreement is also very silent on the modality of, of how uh, those ministers should be appointed. That is why we end up president appointing. Mm, which like, lawyers like, are arguing like it's contrary to the constitution. They, well, like there is Article 165. Exactly. Mm. That is what the national constitution has said. But mm. when you come to the practice, do we have a state constitution which, mm. which could be referenced for those appointments? So far, there is no any state that has a constitution. So there is a constitutional vacuum mm. in the states. Mm. And the law does not allow vacuum. That's why people will, will keep silent when the president does that, if, mm. if it fills the vacuum. Mm. And later, maybe until the constitution of those 10 states uh, are, are, are prepared, uh, that's where I think the powers will go to the governors. But so far now, they don't have any constitutional reference. It's only the president that has constitutional reference. And a governor of a state cannot base his degree on a national constitution because that is beyond him. It's yeah. only the president. So that's why we are in that uh, legal dilemma. But bridging the gap is important so that we don't have the vacuum. But uh, Dr. Okuk, don't you think this will also have a challenge in the state? Uh, for instance, a commissioner or let's say an advisor or a minister uh, will s probably not listen to the governor because he'll saying the same decree that brought you to, to power is also the same person who appointed me, the president. Of course, it, uh, there what will, will be a challenge. But mm. the, the only way out of that challenge is for those governors to speed up uh, the drafting of their own constitution so mm. that they can have powers based on those constitutions. Otherwise, if there are no those constitutions, they will, they will face a lot of problems and the president will always intervene mm. uh, on behalf of those who, uh, who will be rivaling. Mm. And, and, and that is not good for devolution of powers that has been provided in the, in the preamble of the agreement and even in the whole agreement. Uh, more powers were supposed to be devolved to the state and local level. But if the president is the one intervening, of course, that would have implication on those devolution. But what can we do? The law is law, you know. You can't allow a vacuum. So when there is no law at the state level, the president take over and does it on behalf of the... Of, but then, if those governors want to reclaim their constitutional powers, they should speed up the drafting of the constitution of their states and, and endorsed by the parliament, then now they can they can start exercising their powers. Otherwise, without that, the president will exercise powers mm. on their behalf. Yes. So that's, uh, that's, that's where we are. And then the... Maybe, maybe Okuk, let me ask you about the uh, reconstitution, the dissolution and the reconstitution of the transitional national legislature, the parliament and also the council of the states. I mean, uh, last year, uh, Defense Minister Angelina Teng was summoned by a parliamentary committee. She says, I am not answerable to this parliament because it's illegal. The same thing recently happened to the Minister of Information, Mc Michael McQuay. He echoed the same. And uh, N NCAC is quiet about uh, the reconstitution of the parliament. And also, uh, some parties are saying they've already handed over or they've uh, uh, forwarded the names of their nominees to NCAC. But uh, this delay, which is happening in the reconstitution of the transitional legislature. Uh, what do you think is the reason behind this? Why is it taking long? Yeah, it's, it's part of lack of political will, actually, from those parties to implement the agreement in letter and spirit. Mm. Because uh, also they are afraid of, of the progress in the implementation. It mm. means change. Mm. And, and if change comes, uh, some of them will lose the grip on power that they are mm. enjoying now. So it's better to to create deadlocks, uh, and deadlock will lead to delays mm. in the implementation. Then plus the issue of funding also. The government is in a big trouble of money because the the money which is supposed to be for state institution and, and, and for government bodies is being diverted into individual accounts, mm. uh, be it in... Uh, in form of oil cargoes or in form of non-oil revenues, the money do not come to the government account in the central bank. The mm. money goes to individual pockets. So the government is actually is operating without much in in its control. But who are those individuals? Who are those individuals? Because uh, and they members of this of this same government, the very government we're talking about. Well, th these are the 
Uh, some people who call themselves businessmen are tycoon. They are outside the government, but they are linked mm. uh, with a very powerful uh, uh, politician in the government. And then they get their contracts through those politicians. Mm. It's starting from uh, the office of the president uh, down to the other ministries. So, so they, they are well connected. And because of that connection, uh, they make that money. But that is in the expense of the government itself, because the government lacks money, but the money is outside, uh, outside the government. And, and that has really paralyzed uh, any progress uh, in the activities of the government, including the reconstitution of the parliament. So oh. the current parliament isn't pushing for it arrears. What about the new parliament that is coming? That is also another headache. Mm. So if you delay them, uh, they can seal all on, and uh, there won't be a lot of uh, a lot of quarrels because they are illegal at uh, anyhow. Mm. And once they want to impeach a, a, a minister or or uh, someone a minister, the minister will say, "Who are you? You are just illegal." But some ministers so, are so appearing. So it's good for them. Some ministers are appearing before them before the, the, the committees. Is the less powerful ministers that that usually appear, mm. uh, but the powerful ministers can never appear. Or maybe they don't really understand the agreement well. They don't uh, read the no, agreement. No, the fact is that this mm. parliament is illegal. Mm. So how do you appear in front of an illegal body to mm. someone you when you are the legal one? Because the ministers. Uh, have been sworn in in accordance with the, the revitalized peace agreement. Although there has been something missing, they were supposed to be vetted, but they were not vetted. And then they just got sworn in. But the fact remains that they have been sworn in in accordance with the, with the revitalized peace agreement and then the incorporated constitution. So they are legitimate, they are legal. It's only the parliament that has not, uh, has not been sworn in according uh, with the new revitalized again. That's why they remain illegitimate. But then I think politicians who, who want to play around uh, without being caught by the law, I think they like that vacuum mm. uh, so that nobody asks them and then they can drag their feet. Because if, if it was the revitalized parliament in charge, uh, a lot of ministers can lose their job. Mm. because of, uh, of, uh, of dragging their feet and creating deadlocks on the agreement. Because the, the par that parliament has the power to impeach, mm. even impeach the president himself. Right. But that's where we are. That mm. parliament remains outside the scene. And what we have is an illegitimate parliament which is not recognized by the agreement and which is not recognized by the strong politician. Right. So that's one. Let's see the... <coughs> The other hurdle that we are now is chapter two of the agreement. Yes, that's actually, the security, I was going to ask that, yeah. That's the security arrangement. Yeah. Uh, in fact, this is a carryover activity. Mm. The security arrangement was supposed to be completed mostly before the formation of the revitalized government. Especially the graduation of the necessary unified forces. All of them were mm. supposed to, to be completed during the pre-transitional period. Mm. But then... I think that opportunity was missed yeah. simply because there was no political will from the parties to assemble uh, their forces together. Mm -hmm. uh, there was no money uh, for the cantonment and for the training and it was very difficult really to, to control them. So the whole thing just was left like that and, and it remained at the level of the talks. No much. Even the VIP forces that were supposed to be graduated. Uh, up to now, they are stuck, and, and we are told some of them don't have guns and whatever. There are a lot of stories about that. Mm, I mean, recently, and Minister of Information said they, they graduated them with sticks. Graduated <laughs> with sticks. Yeah, <laughs> that's the mm. <laughs> that's that, uh, that's the politics around it. But the the bottom line is that there is no political will uh, from from the main parties who who have those armies to bring them together to unite them because actually. Uh, they are afraid of the repeat of 2016 because they know that... But how will it happen? It's going to be uh, one army, one national army. How, will, uh, how are you are comparing? Why are you comparing it to 2016? They, they are brought from different, mm. from different uh, armies or different militias, actually. Mm. And putting them together and calling them uh, unified forces does not take away that reality. Each one remains uh, coming from this tribe or that tribe. So... 
they they will always be loyal to their politician even under the pretext that they are a unified uh, and do you unified for so there is a fear even if you mm. bring them and put them in J1 again to protect uh, those VIPs uh, any small problem they can start shooting each other again like what happened in 2016 so that fear is there and that's why so it's a problem of confidence is also and trust. Being, being delayed, and, mm. and that's why the issue of graduating with graduating them with a stick and making them to come to J1 to protect the VIP with a stick is less deadly, actually. Mm. So if they manage to do that, it's fine because we know in other part of the world, police use sticks; they don't have guns, and then they they can still do the protection. And if if things come to worse, it is the army to respond. Do you? So, Dr. so Oak. if they do VIP in mm. that way and it works, fine. There is no, uh, yeah. there is no, uh, there is no problem because you can't keep them forever in those training. Centers. I mean, government has been also arguing on this because of the, uh, the, the the sanctions, the arm embargo. But then also, let me ask you: Do you buy the idea, or do you believe, or uh, do you agree with the government when it says it's because of the funding? Uh, lack of funding, that's why they couldn't, or the the graduation of uh, these forces. Uh, is actually taking long. I mean, soldiers have been deserting some of the cantonment sites. I mean, they've been uh, complaining of uh, lack of uh, medical assistance, lack of food. Some have not even received uh, their money or their salary, let's say, for more than a year. Women I, in, in, in some of the cantonment sites, particularly Masnabira, last year gave birth inside the cantonment site. So uh, do you agree it's because of the funding? That's the reason why the graduation is delaying. Yeah, funding is a is a major challenge, mm. but also you ask yourself, what is it that is preventing funding from coming? So that's what takes us again to lack of political will. Because if uh, if the government at the level of the presidency, up to the level of the ministers, mm. are willing to have those parties, they can find money from anywhere, mm. including even making loans for this. Mm. But then, because they they don't have trust in those unified forces, so why 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 waste money on them? It's better to to give money to businessmen and then let them do business rather than spending that money on on these forces. Already, they have spent one hundred and four million U.S. dollar mm. that was disbursed from the pre pre transitional period, but. Where 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 did that money go? Up to mm. now, nobody is accounted for that money, and it is a huge money, 104 million US dollar disappearing uh, for the security, the security uh, sector reform. But yet there is nothing uh, of that kind. So so that's where we are. Uh, the the mechanism that are supposed to implement the chapter two of the security arrangement have been put in place. Uh, those mechanisms are being operating. For instance, JDB or JDB, maybe uh, City Sun VM. All of them are there. Mm. But then their complaint is always uh, there is no political will and there is no money uh, oh. to implement their mandate. Mm. So up to now, they are just there and nothing more. Mm. But it's still even the little money given to them up to now, they cannot account for it. So there is also a question mark whether they are transparent and they are accountable even when they are given money. There is still that question mark. And each party still believe that uh, they, can, they can play around with politics and, uh, and create pressure when they have their armies mm -hmm. ready at the backyard without uh, being disarmed or getting unified. So is some of them look at it as, as a better bargaining uh, strategy to, to have this situation, mm. a situation of no peace and situation of no war. And that. But that's, that's yeah. chapter, chapter 2. The, ho the whole chapter 2, actually, nothing much has been achieved from it. We are still operating with the whole way of doing things. Nothing new has come in. And, and, and do, you, do, you, do, you, do you agree that, or do you believe it's because of, I mean, arms embargo can be one of the reasons delaying this process of graduation? So Sudan has a lot of arms already. Mm. So arm embargo does not really have a lot of meaning here mm. because we don't need even more arms coming from outside. We have enough inside already. Mm. You can see from the communal conflict, mm. uh, 
the level of armament that they have tells you that South Sudan does not lack arms inside. Mm. So the arm embargo is preventing arms that are coming from outside. Mm. But we have enough inside. So what, 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 what sense does this arm embargo make anyway? This mm. is uh, this mm. is what you ask yourself. Right. right. So it's just a it's just a talk. It has it has no any significant influence on the ground. Maybe let's move to uh, yeah. another chapter, Doctor Ukuk, since we're assessing the uh, implementation of the agreement. Maybe let's talk about the humanitarian assistance chapter yeah. three. Uh, what is your evaluation on, on this? That that is a chapter which which the international community has been focusing on so far. Mm. They have not cut the humanitarian assistance. Mm. A lot of NGOs are working in the humanitarian sector. They are providing aids to flood affected vi victims. They are providing aid to those in the POCs under the UNMIS protection. They are providing aids to the IDPs in many mm. places in South Sudan, including mm. even refugees outside the country. They are getting a lot of aid. But there is fatigue also from the donors because the cost is too much. And mm -hmm. every year they think that things will improve so that these people will get repatriated, they get resettled, and then they come back and regain their, uh, their livelihood so that they, they become self-reliant rather than relying on the donors. But this thing is not happening. And it is not happening because uh, uh, the IDPs are refugees do not trust this peace anymore. And there's a lot of fighting going on between the all-out groups and then the, the SPLMIO and the government at times. And there's a lot of defection here and there. So this thing is creating lack of, lack of confidence in the security arrangement itself. And if the security arrangement is not in proper, I don't think the IDPs and refugees will gamble to come back. And, and that's where we... We, we get stuck with the humanitarian chapter of the agreement, including the the money that would have been provided by the government for the special uh, reconstruction fund. Mm. And even that boat, the special recon reconstruction fund boat, that, that should have been established by now so that they, they focus on the destroyed cities and destroyed villages and then uh, give building material to to those IDPs when they return so that they can rebuild their uh, uh, their physical uh, infrastructure and also including even reparation, you know, mm. compensation of those who have lost their properties because of war. The government is not even paying a single penny, penny mm. on that. They are supposed to give 100 uh, million US dollar, the same, the same money they gave to the security sector is the yeah. same that they should have given to the humanitarian sector but so far there's nothing and usually the the the, the justification is that we don't have the money and the international community has decided not to give us money that's, yes on, on, on this it. chapter dr Uko, maybe before we move to the next one uh, what what do you think can be the way forward to ensure that chapter three is implemented chapter three will never move unless chapter two is implemented mm. so the way forward is chapter two. The security arrangement should be in place and then so that you have a trusted army of South Sudan mm. uh, which is, you know, trained according to international standard and which has a national character mm. rather than uh, uh, being loyal to, to political leaders or, or, uh, or aligning themselves on tribal basis. So until you you have that type of armed forces at all sectors, be it police or be it uh, security or be it uh, uh, the SSPDF itself or be it, uh, uh, be it the prison service and all this. I mm -hmm. think until they have that national character, it will be very difficult to have a way forward for Chapter 3. All right. Because uh, mm. uh, what affects Chapter 3 actually is Chapter 1. Mm -hmm. and, then, and again, this chapter one again, if there is no political will from chapter one, it will definitely affect the rest of the chapters the up to so eight. That's yeah. why. So we need to move political will through chapter one, mm -hmm. so that the the top political leaders take it very seriously uh, to make sure the peace agreement is implemented as requiring the mandate in Article 1.2, including protection of civilian in different areas by a national army 
and all and all the the security forces that are being unified mm. then after that it will be very easy to have access to this humanitarian delivery and even reconstruction and even compensation but otherwise with the situation where we are the situation of no war and no peace who would like to go and rebuild his house when they they are not sure it will not be burned mm. tomorrow again this is mm. the dilemma mm. that uh, mm. uh, many are in and you you can see refugees are reluctant even to come back to return to their homes. And the, yeah, mm. IDPs are reluctant even to return because of 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 problem in the security arrangement of chapter two. Right. Let me maybe let's move to uh, uh, to uh, chapter four, which is very critical also, <coughs> and talk about the economy of the country. As a political analyst, you've been following uh, the revitalized peace agreement and those provisions, Dr. Okuk. Uh, maybe uh, give us also your overview on chapter four. Let's talk about the economy of the country. Uh, so far, also we are stuck in chapter chapter four because chapter four required a lot of reforms, mm. reform in principle of the economy, and then you have a lot of reforms in the oil sector, legislative, and oil sector as well. legislative framework. Right. And those legislative framework, they are the one that are supposed to regulate the oil sector, mm. uh, the non-oil uh, sectors, and all the you know, uh, pillars of the economy of the country, particularly the public finance management, so mm. that, you know, the public money is run in a transparent and accountable manner, and nobody can play around without uh, facing the law. So far, this has been resisted. Mm. The institutions that were supposed to be established in accordance with the with chapter four have not been put in place yeah. and 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 we remain stuck the ministry of of finance even remain as the whole ministry operating the whole way it has not changed to a new reality totally you go to the bank of south sudan the same it is still operating on the whole with way with the printing maybe of the uh, 1000 uh, new bank all these so oh. so nothing much has moved uh, from chapter from chapter four and that's why the government is complaining every time there is no money even to play to pay for the salaries, the salaries civil of servants. the civil servant mm. because of a lot of play in the economic sector no control no accountability no transparency and those who think they are smart are the one enjoying the money and running away with the money and the government is getting paralyzed uh, through chapter 4 no reforms are taking place in that and, and that reflect very badly on other chapters also because if you don't have money to to fund the activities those activities will remain as in on the papers and that's what's happening uh, so far now activities in chapter three nobody can implement them because the government cannot provide reconstruction fund which should come from the ministry of finance through the Bank of South Sudan. Mm. The same also with the security arrangement. We are saying there is no money because also Chapter 4 cannot provide that money because there is a lot of corruption uh, taking place there. Chapter 1, even running the ministries that are there is also becoming difficult. And each minister has to survive uh, using his own creative means. Mm. And creative means sometimes mean corruption, by the way. Mm. So this is not helpful. Uh, to the whole flow of the government business in the country, and that's why we are we are stuck to where we are today. And how can we, uh, uh, or what do you think can be the way forward when we talk about Chapter Four, Dr. Okuk, especially uh, the uh, secu I mean the economic sector, non-oil revenue and oil revenue as well. I think it need courage from the President of the Republic, the first Vice President, and the other Vice President. Uh, to do an overall to the Ministry of Finance mm. and also to the Bank of South Sudan and make sure that they are bringing real professional and new faces with clean records. Mm. And those who have the courage to stop uh, these tycoons who are playing with the government money and tell them, no, this is not private money, it is government money, you cannot just take it to your private use. These are the type of South Sudanese who can be part of that reform if they are put in those places. But as long as we keep recycling uh, the whole uh, corrupt official that we know 
in those institutions, they will always rely on their own networks. And those old networks have never been helpful to the country. And that's where we are. Until you see change of guards so that the networks are changed, uh, I don't see any better way forward uh, in that. In fact, we'll, we'll get into two more trouble internationally. Like we, we have heard recently that the, the account of the government has been frozen in Kenya mm. for, for a contract that has no existence on the ground. And it's not the first time something of that kind has happened uh, before. And, and, and this is because of the blunders of those officials uh, who are put in those institutions, particularly the financial institution. So we, we might learn up even with more trouble of economic sanction internationally, because so far now, a number of oil companies, they are under sanctions. Mm -hmm. And they are under sanction because they, uh, they are playing with, with international uh, uh, funding flow. They have records of malpractices, uh, yes. probably. So, so this thing, other countries will not accept because it can spoil their economy. So that's mm. that's where we are, and uh, and it's very difficult to to move if the political will in chapter one does not really uh, take its responsibility very critically to move chapter four mm. and and create an overall to those institutions that are managing the public fund and and uh, doctor in chapter five what do you think so far has been implemented and those key provisions that have not been implemented maybe for instance talking about uh, the establishment of the hybrid court and but in general let's talk about the transitional uh, justice yeah the the transitional justice is three parts of course mm. you have the truth uh, reconciliation and healing commission that's supposed mm. Uh, to have been formed, but so far nothing has happened. Mm. Uh, then you have the hybrid court of South Sudan, uh, where the African Union have been negotiating on the MOU with the government. Mm. Uh, it was only maybe last month that the government gave a green light that they, they can go ahead mm. uh, to start the establishment. But still, uh, the bills that are supposed to be drafted to details the selection and appointment of uh, officials who will be working in this hybrid court. Nothing has moved so far in that technical level. So it means we are still stuck until uh, you have the bill uh, ready, uh, because the bill will spell out the details of, mm. of what uh, that hybrid court will be doing and how the judges will be selected and all, all the prosecutors. Mm. So nothing has moved. Re the reparation authority is nobody talk about it because it means also the government has to f provide money. So if the government is in trouble with chapter four, where will it get money for a reparation authority which, which will go and compensate those who have lost their properties uh, during the war? So the whole chapter is actually nowhere. Mm. and uh, And there is a reluctance, actually, particularly when it comes to the hybrid court, because some of the politicians who are in a strategic position, they are suspect, mm. uh, according to Basenjo reports and according to other human, human rights reports. And there is a requirement that if you are a suspect uh, who has been involved in committing atrocities during the, the war from 2013 onward, you are not supposed to enjoy any government position. So, so if they implement Chapter 5 well, it means a number of current politicians will lose their position. So mm. why do they care, by the way, uh, to, to speed up uh, that chapter yeah. if it can make them to lose their, uh, their position? So that's why they are dragging their feet. And the African Union is not also serious. They, they will come, they talk, they go away, then they come back, then the year is gone. Mm. And so far, yes, we are remaining with one year for the expiry date of this agreement. Mm. And once the, the expiry date come, maybe the whole chapter will be thrown away and nobody will talk about it again. Right. Yeah. And, and talking about that, I will bring this uh, to your attention later. We talk about the election a little bit. But uh, uh, those are some of the uh, key provisions, or let's say, uh, very important chapters in the revitalized peace agreement, the five. But let's also, Dr. Ukuk, not forget 
uh, the uh, Joint Monitoring and Evalu Evaluation Commission, uh, JMEC, which was later on because of the Revitalization Forum, it was actually reconstituted uh, RJMEC. How do you look at the performance of RJMEC, Dr. Oko? Before we go to RJMEC, let's look at Chapter 6 because it's yes. an important condition. Yes, the sure. agreement. That is the Parameters permanent the uh, constitution making. Con yes, constitution. The RGMEG itself is, was supposed to conduct a workshop for the parties yeah. after the formation of the government. Mm -hmm. But so far, that workshop has not taken place. And if that workshop does not take place, it means there will never be any legislation mm. uh, for the constitutional making process. And if we do not start the constitutional making process because it will only be given 24 months it means two years is it mm. um, and if you do not start it so that you complete it in two years you will not have election because the election is conditional on having a constitution which which adopt federalism and which will have a lean government these are the conditions that are provided mm. in that so far nobody cares about it and they know that this is the cut which will lead to the extension of the revitalized peace government. So why do you hurry anyway if, if you have already secured your position in the government? You are already a minister, and then you are told to go and conduct that workshop which will come up with the law, which will speed up the constitutional process. Why do you care? Mm -hmm. uh, no? uh, and you know that that process takes two years when it starts. So it's better you delay it. You delay the process. And, uh, and when you delay the process of constitutional making, it means you will delay, you will extend the agreement you, you will until you wait, in, in and you wait until mm. two years uh, of the constitutional making. So it means you will have just additional six years in power. So as a politician, if you have six years in power, why do you, why do you hurry anyway? So this is, this is where we are today. Right. Coming to chapter... Uh, Seven on RGMEC and even city sum, which mm. is connected to RGMEC. And other mechanisms as well. Actually, yeah. is also is also another problem in the <coughs> in the revitalized peace agreement. The the RGMEC up to now is still operating as in, with interim share. They have not brought a prominent African personality who is respected uh, to share the RGMEC. The last year we had was Festus Muhai mm. from Botswana. And from the time he left, we didn't have any, any prominent African personality to come and share the argument. Mm. So the share that we have as, is an interim share coming from Kenya and again replaced from Kenya with no weight because he has just been a military man. And military commanders are never respected by politicians, by the way. So mm. this is where we are. Is an argument which, which has a problem with its share. It is not respected by the parties because it does not have the weight it's mm -hmm. supposed to have. Mm -hmm. That's one. The other thing is the, is the regular meeting that they have and the reporting that they come out. Mm -hmm. They just remain at that level because the, they are supposed to recommend remedial action if the agreement is not moving. Mm -hmm. But then they only give the reports and then they only give the recommendation what to do, but they don't follow the remedies of, uh, of how to correct uh, the missed opportunities and how to, how to move the, the peace process forward in a more rigorous manner. They don't, they don't do that. They are comfortable with their lifestyle in Juba. As long as they get their salaries, why do they care? Uh, after all, it is not their country. Uh, they are here actually to help another country and if that country does not want to help itself, why do they care? This is, this is the attitude we have seen from the argument. The same with the city sum. And this attitude is also creating problem for the do donors because donors are saying, why do we waste our time funding uh, those who are supposed to monitor and evaluate the agreement, and they are not doing much, so it's better let them look for their own fund. So they will also learn into the same problem that the government is learning itself with mm. lack of fund. Mm. And some of them will resign from their position because they did not come here to volunteer. <laughs> that's that's <laughs> a fact. Sure. They came mm. here to work and to mm. get something. But if, 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 if the donors are not paying them money, some of them will disappear one by one. And then we will remain with an agreement that does not have 
evaluators that does not have monitors. That's mm. that's the reality we, we we might get in. But anyway, we are remaining with one year only mm -hmm. to the expiry date of the agreement. So we'll see uh, how how it move forward. But the argument is just is just no not influential anymore, including the civil society of South Sudan that are within Argemek, they have become also another another inactive uh, force within the Argemek. But the civil society, they look at it as a small, uh, let's say, a small institution within Argemek. Argemek brings on board all uh, the parties to the agreement. So uh, civil society has, uh, doesn't have a weight. How do you, don't you think no, so? No, they have a weight mm. when it comes to the quorum. Because mm. if, they, if, they, if they boycott the meeting of the argument, the argument will not have a quorum to meet. Mm. And if the argument does not meet, it means they will not get paid by the donors. So the civil society has been helping the argument to meet by completing the quorum. Mm. And, and the quorum that does not produce anything apart from talk, sh talk shows inside the, the room, and after that releasing reports that are useless, reading even a resolution that are not implemented mm. and then each one get his sitting allowance and that's all mm. and then they wait for another another meeting and that's that's the level they have been operating i was expecting the civil society to pull out from the argument but they so far they have not done that so it means they are they are accomplice to what is being done because they they complete the quorum uh, the quorum of the of the argument to meet mm. and i i understand even sometime when they are not around they are called by phone to rush in so that the quorum is complete and they do that without uh, without uh, without regretting uh, uh, that style but that's what i see as a weakness from our civil society yeah you earlier they, they used yes. to be very strong during the the negotiation, the negotiation. but mm -hmm. after the negotiation they have I think surrendered or what happened, we don't know. Mm. This is the this is my observation. Right. And and you earlier talked about one year for the transitional period to end. Uh does that mean after one year we're going to hold elections? Uh, what do you what do you say about that, especially the elections according to the agreement? According to the agreement with the situation we are in, the condition for holding the election are not in place. Mm. And first condition is the security arrangements. The second is the repatriation uh, and uh, reintegration of the IDPs and the refugees so that they get back to their places. Then you will have constitutional making completed. Then you have census. These are the, these are the conditions. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so far, none of them have been implemented. So it means there is no election taking place in accordance with the agreement. Unless the parties sit down and then they, they amend the agreement and slash out all those conditions. And if they slash out all those conditions, then election can take place uh, as proposed by Museveni, for example. Mm. But then we have already experienced of 2010. What it means when you conduct election in an environment which is not secure, in an environment which is full of bitterness, and in an environment which is full of arms, mm. it will already will lead to what we call post-election violence. And post-election violence means sitting down again on the negotiation table and coming back with a coalition government of national unity repeating the same thing that we have done so what 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 is it that we are looking for and it will be a waste of money and i don't think there is any donor who is ready to fund that type of election which is not free which is not fair which is not credible it won't happen how can we have free credible and fair election dr cook you won't have it until until you have the reforms in place mm. the security reforms in place you have the political reform in place civil service reform in place you have economic reform in place mm. and then you have transitional justice in place so it means you have to implement all the chapters of the agreement from chapter one up to chapter eight this is where now you can talk of the election because the election is the end game of the whole transitional period mm. it will it will mark the end of that transitional period then you go now to 
to elected government, uh, that that will go politically. So that's that's where we are. Mm. I don't think election is viable as we speak because the conditions that are supposed to be fulfilled before going to election are not in place. Right. And then the environment, even if you slash out those conditions, the environment for conducting a credible and free election is not there. So it's people have to be very cautious to mm. rush to those elections. Yes. What other areas would you like to share with us before you wind up, Dr. Okuk? Especially as we mark one year tomorrow uh, since the establishment of the uh, unity government, especially the presidency. Yeah, we, we came a long way mm. to have this country. That is one thing we, we, we need to remember. And because we came a long way, we have a lot of challenges ahead. Mm. And, but those challenges can be overcome because the, the history of South Sudan has lessons of how, how people have, have moved on and they have resolved their problems. So it is time to start identifying uh, what is the problem really? Because sometimes we just undermine this. What is the problem? People need to identify it in clear terms. Mm -hmm. Okay? And then you come, who is the problem? Because also even, even if we identify what is the problem, there is the question of who is the problem because there are people who are troublemakers who are benefiting from the war situation. We need to identify who are they. And once you identify them, we, we can know how to deal with them uh, through many means, either to persuade them to change their attitude or they will get into sanctions. That's, that's, that's given. And then why, why these problems are occurring? It's, it's also time to ask those questions. Uh, I could see from the report of the National Dialogue, they, they have tried to dwell into why the problem in South Sudan, but they reduce it into two persons only. That is President Kiir and Victoria, which is not fair. They are not the only one uh, who are a problem to South Sudan. There are people around them and there are people attached with them, including the Gen Council of Elders. They have been also part of, of this problem. So they cannot distance themselves and reduce the whole problem of South Sudan to two people only. So why these problems are recurring every time? People need to sit down and, and find the root causes. And then from there, I think we, we can move forward. But then the most important thing there has to be a change. Mm. You can't continue with the whole way of no peace and no war. That won't help this country. So there has to be a change, and that change has to happen if the country has to, to pick up. Otherwise, mm. if we remain without a change, we'll be just complaining of the same things every year and all this. So now, as we mark the, the one-year anniversary of the formation of the revitalized government of national unity in a partial manner, uh, would like to encourage those parties to speed up the full formation of, of the government at all levels, horizontally and vertically, uh, so that there could be a reason why people can say, let us uh, do the extension, uh, if, they, if they see that there is seriousness for the parties to implement the agreement beyond chapter one. And once these uh, bodies are established concurrently yeah. and then they move on, I think there will not be hurry for election uh, as long as we are putting the situation back into a better uh, environment uh, that South Sudanese can one day say, let's go for election. So, so formation, full formation of the government at all level is a must. And I don't think the parties will have any better agreement than this agreement. Uh, even if they throw it away and then they think they can negotiate again, they will come up with almost similar issues that are in this agreement. Right. So it's better not to throw this agreement away. Let them start implementing it and then let's start to think how extension can be done if there is progress in the implementation. But as long as there is no progress in implementation, the question of extension even will be useless. Right. Yes.
Dr. Jamie Sukuk, political analyst, thank you very much for speaking to us today. Thank you, uh, Kili, and my pleasure to have talk with you. Uh -huh.